uh, have been invited to share this experience with you uh, this evening. Uh, and certainly we are deeply honored to have so many of you out to share this experience with us. Uh, I've been to D.C. numerous times. I've spoken a few times uh, and had a few special experiences in visiting D.C. and being able to share my ideas with uh, our community here. And this evening is a certainly ranks among one of the very special uh, occasions that uh, I will have had to uh, share my ideas with our D.C. African community, uh, primarily because I'm sharing it with my dear friend uh, and teacher, Sister Marimba Richards. Uh, I want to dedicate my remarks this evening to a couple of very special Africans in my life. Uh, one is my mother, uh, Sister Mabel E. Rush Guyton Baldwin. A little old sister from the backwoods of Mississippi and Alabama who uh, nurtured me into uh, some degree of African maturity and certainly provided me with the early foundation for loving and believing in African people, for believing in our possibilities and our basic goodness and in African victory. I can say a great deal about her. I dedicated my book to her, along with another important sister, or what I call queen mother in my life, my first and second grade teacher, uh, Sister Ethel B. Morgan, another sister from the backwoods of Alabama who believed in African potential in little African children and gave the best of her life to make that possible. She is not the second person this evening, but she is the second person to whom my book is dedicated. The second person that I dedicate my remarks to this evening uh, is a brother who had a tremendous impact on my life, my thinking. Were it not for these two queen mothers, the book would have certainly been dedicated to him. Uh, but he is always in my thoughts. Uh, his spirit is very viable in me. And as I continue to uh, attempt to conduct myself in African warriorhood, Brother Bobby E. Wright, I assume that some of you have heard of Brother Bobby. You may have even been graced with being able to meet him and share that special African spirit that he represented. I was fortunate to have come under his tutelage as a young brother. He and I both engaged in the study of psychology. And we just became extremely close. I learned so much from him. I learned to respect the uncompromising commitment and dedication to African victory that was always ever present in Bobby's self-presentation. We worked together for many years. Uh, we were part of the Center for Inner City Studies, which often became the foundation and springboard for the Comedic Institute that now exists in Chicago, Illinois, under the magnificent African Center leadership of Brother Jacob Carruthers, uh, who uh, formed another part of that influential, what I call master teachers, uh, experience and influence that I came under very fortunately, 
that the ancestors graced me with the opportunity to study and learn from these great dedicated African warriors. Uh, if you knew Bobby and knew him well, I'm sure you would probably hear him speaking through me <laughs> and many of the ideas that I espouse and will try to share with you this evening and persuade you as to their credibility and their survivalness in helping us to understand the African mind and to correct the aberrations in that mind and to thrust that mind toward the ultimate African victory so that we can reconstruct a world into what I call an African world order for African people. Uh, I'm going to talk essentially about uh, this book. I guess I've been talking about this book for about 20 years even before it was ever published. That's all I ever talk about. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about that context. I certainly appreciate uh, my sister warrior, Sister Marimba, for laying that clear context and framework for understanding and or reconceptualizing uh, Africanity. We Africans in America are deeply in need of clarity about our condition, deeply in need of clarity about who we are, who our enemies are, and deeply in need of, of clarity for what we must do for ourselves and what we will do to our enemies. Uh, I don't know to what extent we're going to be able to clarify all of that this evening but I'm going to do my best. And to the degree that Mabel Baldwin and Bobby Wright's spirit will speak through me this evening, hopefully we'll get the job done. Uh, the, this idea, this model of African personality that I have attempted to crystallize in the framework of this book had the purpose of attempting to take my observations of African reality as I have experienced it over the course of my life and through the mediums of knowledge that I have encountered in my life and try to articulate the basic condition of Africanity in the psychological experience or condition of African people. You know, I think we, we, can, we can see on a more physical plane, a more surface plane, it's much easier for us to comprehend that we are different from non-African people. And to a large extent, we can, we may debate whether or not we're African, but I think we generally accept the fact that we are not physically white people. That may be why we engage in a lot of energy trying to approximate it to the best of our ability. But I think it comes out of this recognition that we know we're not there yet. So on a physical plane, we have less difficulty in conceptualizing who we are. On a psychological or mental plane, we have a little more difficulty. Primarily, I think, because that plane, we can view that plane as an invisible plane. You know, we don't have necessarily concrete dimensions to which we can validate that plane. And if our scholars don't provide us with the kind of paradigms of understanding of that plane, then we're sort of left to hit and miss on our own. You know, we can try to feel our way like we're feeling our way in the dark. Some of us may get to some level of clarity and others of us be searching aimlessly in the dark 
going in all kinds of directions and defining who we are psychologically. So one primary purpose of this model was to try to identify on this psychological or mental plane what it means to be African with the idea in mind that if we generate enough clarity there, it will take care of the physical plane also. Because in the African worldview, we can't separate them, you see. One validates the other, you see. One affirms the other. So that's one thing. I'm going to get into that momentarily, how I attempted to deal with that issue of identifying Africanity at the psychological level. But also, wanted to try to articulate, given this Africanity, it obviously is not enough if we are not aware of it or conscious of it, and therefore how to utilize it as a base of power in the world for African people. How to use it as a springboard of empowerment for African people. And in doing so, it should enable us to correct whatever aberrations that it may have acquired under this brutal experience of white domination okay, that it has certainly had to undergo for the last 400 years in particular, and at least 2,000 years of Eurocentric encroachment upon the African mind. And thirdly, I'm not sure if I said one, two, three, or four, but thirdly or fourthly, somewhere down the line in the, the multi-purpose of this model, we wanted to determine that given the nature of this analysis, how do we heal this African mind? How do we correct these aberrations? What methodologies must we utilize given the nature of the problem that we've defined? See, once you define a problem, if you define it clearly enough, it tells you, how you why you have to focus whatever it is you have to do. And if you do it really clear, it'll tell you what you need to do to correct it. And so we wanted to do that. And finally, a major purpose or objective behind this model was to make all of this relate to my belief that what African people have lost over this sojourn of brutalization by white domination is our nation, our sense of our nationhood as African people. And if that's what we lost, then any model of the African mind and the recovery of the African mind must at the same time ultimately be the recovery of African nationhood you see, among African people. So we're just not talking about psychology here when we talk about the African mind. We're talking about a holistic analysis of the African condition. And if we are in a politically impotent condition, then articulating the nature and correctives in the African mind should naturally lead us to political power, you see, to race power, to national, pan-African nationalist power for African people in the world. So that's what I set out to, to try to respond to. My critique, my just very quickly to dispense with whatever else had been going on in psychological theories about African people, particularly under Eurocentric theories, which dominate even the theories of African people in this, in this field, is that we have been so conceptually incarcerated to borrow Brother Wade Nobles' concept by the European worldview, that when we set out to articulate the basic condition of the African mind, 
we are just merely painting over the European mind or the degree to which we think we understand it in blackface and imposing that up on African people. So we need to move within the framework of the African worldview if we are going to articulate the real basic condition of the African mind, in my view. And that's what I attempt to do in this work. Basically, I, in trying to res respond to this issue of what is the basic Africanity or this African nature of the African mind or the African personality or psyche, I drew up on the basic core of the African worldview of harmony with nature or oneness with nature and see in that what we call the extension of the person into the outer limit or as Sister Marimba just said to the cosmic limits you see of reality from the innermost or the deepest most recesses of the African mind to the outermost recesses or reaches of the universe or the cosmos itself. I believe that this notion of African spirituality is what we mean by this African self-extension orientation, as I call it in this model. That we're saying that the African spirit validates itself, the African self validates itself by interconnecting, by transcending the physical boundaries that ultimately give it some degree of form in reality. But its real form is to be in a constant state of rhythm, attempting to interconnect with the cosmic whole of the universe. And of course that begins with me connecting with you and with us connecting with everybody else. And with us connecting with everything else, you see, until we have unity, you see, all this Mahatian balance, you see, in consciousness, with the universe, one with the creator. The creator is in all things. And that begins with the deepest, innermost reaches of the African mind to the outermost reaches of the phenomenal universe uh, of African consciousness or deeply rooted consciousness. And so I posit this construct called the African self-extension orientation to define this basic Africanity in the African personality. If you observe African people all around the world, you find this African spirituality, this African self-extension orientation, this interconnecting, that that's how the self is validated in the African culture reality, through its ability to interconnect you see, to connect itself beyond the physical boundaries of the individual. And we believe in African psychology that that's what this basic Africanity is. That's why you find it in African people all over the world. And you don't have to survey them because they may deny that they have it. All you have to do is observe them and understand the principles of, upon which it operationalizes itself. And you can validate its presence, you see. So we may speak different languages. We inhabit different geographical uh, areas of the world. We can even, you can even observe us in different time frames in history. And yet you find this basic psychological core of African spirituality defining the basic African character of African people. And that's very important for African people in the diaspora where white domination is so intensely uh, superimposed upon our reality. That surely we know that if we took a survey of African people throughout the United States, for example, and asked them if they possess African spirituality, they may give you a reaction something like what Dr. Marimba alluded to and disclaim it as something superstitious, magical, primitive or something that is uh, something that demeans uh, their credibility as human beings. But it does not invalidate the fact that this condition defines the African character. 
I believe that it is a biogenetic condition like many of my colleagues have articulated in their work. This is not something that we acquire through experience. This is something that is transmitted to generation after generation of African people. I refer to it uh, sort of like uh, uh, Sister Wellesley and other, other scholars have used this analogy of a microchip in their work. To articulate it's like embedded in this African self-extension orientation or this African spirituality is the whole history of knowledge of African people. That means it has to be deeply rooted in the psyche. Deeply rooted, you see. But it's like, a, it's, it's like the, the cumulative pool of knowledge of African people is there. And in order for African people to access this, this potential that they have, this, this, this microchip, to, to unlock the keys, you see, to its expression and its viability, we have to engage in certain kinds of processes of growth or of transformation or of change. Okay? And we'll get to that momentarily. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a deeply rooted, genetically embedded psychological condition in African people. And we can define it, observe it in African people throughout the world and when it manifests itself, African people most often are not conscious of it, and yet we manifest it just the same. We do it in all the ways that we express ourselves, through our songs, our dance, our music, through our speech, through the content of our speech, our language, you see, through the energies that we use, the physical energies that we use for bonding with each other, for interfacing with each other, and for other aspects of our perceptive uh, systems, okay, and how we interact and interface with phenomenal experience, or how we expect experience uh, phenomena in the universe. But I argue in this model that that's not enough, obviously. It is not enough to have this basic Africanity deeply embedded in our psychical system. And have African people not be aware of it. And we can engage in some very strange kind of activities relative to it. Like if you have, I use the analogy all times that if you have, if you're sitting on a pot of gold and you don't know it's gold, then you may give it away. May not even sell it, you see. You just give it away, you see. Or you sell it. The important thing is you don't value it, and so you are out to get rid of it. You, it's a burden to you, you see, in that regard. And so I think that the, the issue here is then that the Africanity, this deeply rooted, unconscious, genetic Africanity, is not sufficient to propel African people in terms of their survival. That what we need is a conscious dimension, an awareness of it, a consciousness of it that will allow us then to nurture it, maintain it, perpetuate it, reproduce it, and propel it in such a way that it allows us to maintain ourselves through infinity. And I call this dimension of the African personality African self-consciousness. This consciousness of ourselves, of our Africanity, and therefore, it gives us the ability to utilize this Africanity, to thrust this Africanity, to maintain and rebuild and fortify ourselves in the world as African people, and therefore to maintain our integrity as African people in the world. Now, I think this is a very important construct in this model. And some people that we refer to it with, ah, that's the, that's the political construct in your model. Well, when we talk about power, yes. It is the directing component of the personality system. It says, this is Africanity. This is valuable. This must be preserved. This must be protected. This must be projected and propelled, you see, into defining 
African reality and validating African reality in the world. And there are some basic characteristics that I associate with this consciousness. One is a recognition of our Africanity, that we are an African people, collective. You see, collective race, cultural consciousness. It, rep it represents that recognition. Secondly, it recognizes that in order to fortify this race consciousness, it must continue being a mode of expanding itself through generating knowledge of itself. And thirdly, in order to maintain and strengthen this African self-consciousness, then it must be about creating an environment, support systems, that fortify it, that strengthens it, you see, that allow it to maintain and preserve and protect itself. And so it's about creating what we call African-centered institutions, a recognition of a prioritization on the creation of these institutions, because it is through these institutions that we gain the regenerative power, you see, to strengthen ourselves, to reinforce ourselves, our Africanity, and to fortify that Africanity. And fourthly, I associate with this African self-consciousness the recognition of anti-Africanness as being dangerous to the maintenance and the perpetuation of Africanity. And therefore, the institution of a resolute posture of resistance to any anti-African energy. So within this consciousness comes the self-fortifying, you see, forces that allow the African personality to reinforce itself, to maintain itself, to preserve and protect itself, and to perpetuate itself, and to thrust itself into uh, the future as a viable, as the viable source of power, a base of power for African people. Now, obviously, we have to develop our consciousness while I believe that our consciousness has to be partly inherited because it is nothing more than the conscious dimension of our Africanity. But at the same time, we understand that consciousness is informed by experience. And therefore, it's important that the kind of experiences that nurture and reinforce this consciousness be African-centered or they will not do the job that therefore, if we use the analogy of a child developing in life or throughout life, then clearly we must have an African-centered space, experiential space, developmental space for the nurturing and cultivation of this African self-consciousness. Or it may not reach its fullest expression of maturity. Just like any other aspect of development, the environment can thwart that development by not allowing opportunities for natural expression. It can limit that. It can actually be hostile to that and suppress that, you see. And so we must have an African-centered support system, developmental support system, experiential, you see, environment, to cultivate and nurture this African self-consciousness. The most literal example of that, or representation of that, would be an African citizen environment defined by the presence of African people in the developmental space of African children if they are to develop African self-consciousness. And obviously, the antithesis of that would be an environment where there is the absence of African people. Now, we can look at degrees in between. And I su submit that, depending upon the extremity of those de degrees, we will have negative or adverse consequences for the African self-consciousness. So the closer we are to an alien support system, 
and I say that advisedly, we'll correct that momentarily, that, that, that uh, problem in logic. <laughs> but it, this alien support system, it supports itself, you see, not Africanity, that the closer we come to that pole of developmental experience for African self-consciousness, the greater we will have aberrations in the naturalness of that expression. And the closer we come to the African pole, physical pole, the greater should be the probability of a strengthening and optimization of this African self-consciousness. Obviously, physicalness is not enough. That's just the concrete dimension through which other forces operate. But if we don't have an African physical environment, then we don't have the possibility of African-centeredness taking place. And so we must then have, must have African-centered content in the develop, defining the developmental life space of African children if they are to develop a healthy African self-consciousness. And that means the environment of African children, if it is a natural African-centered environment, then it must be infused with African-centeredness from the icons that define, I mean, the whole symbolic world of that environment to the direct instruction of that environment. It must be about the cultivation of African self-consciousness. I argue that probably one of the great difficulties or dangers in the development of African children under white domination is the fact that African children are not taught African-centeredness. We are not even provided with a symbolic environment that reinforces African-centeredness. So if we get it, it is by some special circumstance, some exceptional circumstance in our experience, in our developmental experience. Now that's, I contend that that's a very dangerous condition that we must recognize. That if we don't have African-centered children, it's because we don't have African-centered developmental environments in which those children are nurtured. I contend that if we have crazy African children, it's because crazy African adults are socializing them. I don't think there's any other way we can get that outcome. That there is no way that we can produce African children with a weak or nominal African self-consciousness and have around them African adults with optimal African self-consciousness. That's impossible. That's impossible. And so I think that we don't have to look very far to identify the source of the problem, or at least the manifestation of the problem, the locus of that problem, where the development of African children are concerned. That I think that what happens and with the implication of this model is obviously in an African-centered environment where the environment itself is infused with Africanity, and I'm going to come back to that later on and talk about the specifics of what that environment should entail, then we should have an optimal outcome. We should have an optimal African self-consciousness. But under this derivation, this, this, this extreme negative pole or alien pole, which I believe, at least from the midpoint of this continuum to the limits of this alien pole, this defines the experiences of most African children under white domination. And so what happens then is that we get these varied outcomes of African self-consciousness in our children because we have varied manifestations of it in our community at large, because we don't have the environmental experiential uh, framework for cultivating African self-consciousness in African people. So I call that Eurocentric socialization or indoctrination of African people. And in the book I use a little diagram where I have, I borrowed it from a colleague of mine, where under the optimal socialization or developmental pattern, 
we have these little blackheads, which symbolizes Africanity being, being solidified in the person. And under this Eurocentric track, or this alien track of development, which again, I contend, some variation of that defines the, develop, the socialization of African children under white domination, then we find these blackheads being encroached upon by these white squares until we get into this level of maturity and the entire blackhead now has been subsumed or overtaken by the white squares. And so now we have these whiteheads, you see, <laughs> defining African reality, you see. Now what we, obviously that's symbolic and that has a very powerful symbolism because uh, it's written on white paper as well, so <laughs> these are the white right heads. But, but, but the, 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 the point that I'm, I'm trying to make there is that to make us more conscious of the fact that, yes, this model says that there is something already in the package, but it says there must be an experiential, you see, nurturing that unlocks, you see, what's in the package and allows it the possibility of optimal expression. And so if anti-African forces define the experiential environment, then we're going to get an anti-African outcome or a suppression of what came with the package, you see. And so I think that that's what happened, I believe, in the development of African children under white supremacy, rule and domination, is that because we have this negative outcome, which I call cultural misorientation in African people, and I use that term to refer to the fact that what really characterizes this mental disordered condition in African people as a result of this alien or Eurocentric indoctrination of African people is that we develop an incorrect cultural orientation that is a Eurocentric, or what I call a white supremacy domination orientation to reality. And therefore, that is incorrect. That is a misorientation. I think it is it is, it has been, it has sort of been fallacious in, in psychological social science circles for us to imply that African people are disoriented or to imply that they are without a reality-based orientation, when in reality, they are without an African-centered orientation to reality. But this Eurocent Eurocentric orientation to reality is indeed fostered and reinforced by the American social reality, which defines this environment under white supremacy domination. So I'm not sure that we get at the seat of the problem when we, use, we would use the term, the psychiatric term disorientation, when really and truly this is a, this is a, a what I call a pseudo uh, functional orientation that is allowed to masquerade as reality-based because the white supremacy-dominated social reality reinforces it. You see, it fosters it, it nurtures it in African people. It makes it necessary for African people to maintain this consciousness, this alien self-consciousness. And what happens then under, under, under white supremacy, social indoctrination of African people we have in the personality structure the superimposition of this alien Eurocentric consciousness or white supremacy domination consciousness superimposed upon our natural African self-consciousness, suppressing its natural expression. And so what we have here, we have an African psychical structure that is being suppressed through oppression, through cultural oppression. And what is being expressed is a distorted presentation of African consciousness in an alien consciousness form. And I think that, uh, that, that that's, that's the dilemma that, 
that defines, I think, the, at least the inner cyclical working of what takes place in the African mind under white domination, at least on the base of this model. So what do we have? We got a natural African structure that still exists within the cyclical system of African people. But the white domination miseducation, you see, and cultural indoctrination on African people, it superimposes this Eurocentric consciousness up on it. And now, so it's like we're wearing this extra hat <laughs> sitting up on our head. But we're wearing it, and we wear it. They reinforce it so forcefully that it feels like a part of our head. So we almost wear it naturally. Or we wear it as if it were a natural part of our makeup. And so what happens, what makes it so dangerous is that we, here we have what I call a grossly psychopathological condition in African people masquerading as functional normalcy under white supremacy domination. And I think that, and really, and really truly, I, I think this is very critical that we, that, we, that we focus on this because I think it explains, I know it explains, the contradictions in our behavior. You know, uh, W.B. Du Bois, and I hate to use this, but he's prominent, and so he, we're all aware of his notion of this dual consciousness. Now, my reading of Brother Du Bois suggests that he's saying something different from what I'm trying to say. Uh, that my reading of him, and some of you Du Bois likes, I'm sure will correct me if I am wrong, <laughs> in your view, but my reading of him suggests that he was, like we do, under white domination. You see, what we do under the best of circumstances, and I'm going to digress for a minute to make this point, however, but as see, on the white supremacy domination, it says white is superior, you see, to black. And under the best of conditions in our combating it, we reduce it to a level of equivalence with Africanity. That's the best we do. We create equivalence. And we call that doing battle with it. We say, come down from that perch, you see, and get down here with us. And I think, and I'm saying that to say, and I'll, I will deal with the implication of that a little later. But I'm saying that to say what I think Brother Du Bois was talking about is what some of our truly misguided scholars refer to in contemporary time as this biculturality. You see, that's what they have done. They have made equivalent, you see, functionally equivalent in, term, in terms of mental health functioning, a Eurocentric orientation in African people. So they are saying, and Brother Du Bois, what I read him as saying was that we got these two conflicting, you know, uh, realities operating in the African psyche. This American, you know, he called it, and this African, you see. And the African, the challenge for the African is to try to balance these things out. And I contend that's gross mental disorder, you see. They are antithetical, you see. That what Brother Du Bois was defining, and what my misguided colleagues, I believe, are defining in biculturality, is they are trying to give functional legitimacy to a gross condition of mental disorder in African people. Because what they're saying is the contradiction is the natural condition of African life. They're saying for African people to on the one hand be African, and on the other hand, to think, feel, and act like white people somehow makes sense, has logic to it. That's normal. And somehow African survival can come out of that. African affirmation can come out of that. Somehow, most illogically, African optimization can express itself through that, you see. That's a dangerous position that's a very contemporary position. Matter of fact, in academic circles, that's one of the constructs that's riding high now, biculturality. That we are a bicultural people. So they're saying that to adopt the social reality of the enemies, the fundamental enemies of African people, anti-Africanness is healthy for African people. I mean, white supremacy couldn't state it better, could it? That's where we got it from. 
That's where we got that logic from. I call it white supremacy logic, you see. It only makes sense in a logical system defined by white supremacy domination, you see. And so, therefore, I think the, the instructive issue about this construct for us is to recognize that I believe all of us are afflicted by this condition of mental disorder under white supremacy domination. All of us are afflicted by it. I believe that we are afflicted in different degrees, however. Some of us more so than others, depending upon our particular circumstance in life. That some of us have grown up in a situation where we were, we were totally encroached upon by the white square. And others partially encroached upon by the white square and others only minimally encroached upon by the white square. What does that mean? That means contradiction prevails throughout, but it can exist in lesser degrees, you see. What I call from severe to minimal misorientation that can define the African, the African personality under white supremacy domination. But again, I think that the important thing of this construct, it says that all African people suffer from it whether you are so-called highly educated or undereducated, whether you uh, live in an economically, uh, highly, socially mobile environment or an economically depressed environment, whether you see yourself as uh, wealthy or poor, or whether you see yourself in various other segmentations of African life, that you are afflicted by it. And most importantly, whether you see yourself as a healer or a healee, you see, you are afflicted by it. I like to always say, you know, we get this thing on who's on the, who's sick, the one on one side of the desk or the other side of the desk, you see. It's, the one who's the sickest is the one who recognizes that somebody's sick, that they sick. <laughs> the other one is much sicker, you see, no matter what their role is in the society, you see. So oftentimes we'll find that the psychologist, the psychiatrist, or some other form of healer is much more disordered than the person that they're trying to heal. But because the social environment, you see, the social structure of white domination reinforces the one that it has, you see, anointed as sane, then the other person has a much more difficult time you see, gaining some sense of legitimacy about their mental health. And that is, the again, the contradiction. So usually, any African who realizes this predicament of the African mind and attempts to strike a victorious blow on behalf of the African mind, the affirmation of it, they are defined as disorder by the white supremacy domination system. Yes. And it can be various degrees of disorderness that you are labeled, depending upon the degree to which you stand committed and dedicated to challenging, you see, the destruction of white supremacy domination. So you see we have this reversal of reality that takes place, whereby the sane on the white supremacy domination becomes defined as the insane. And everything else is somewhere in between. And so you see that this is a very powerful system of mind control that is being imposed upon the African mind under white supremacy domination. And I call it cultural misorientation because I think that that's where the deficiency lies. You see, power comes from culture. That's what Sister Marimba was talking about. That's where power comes from. Power doesn't come from voting. Power doesn't come from, you know, owning a store. Power comes from your being in control of your definition of reality, being defined by your history, you see, your philosophy, you see, your social reality. And from that, you understand the importance of owning the store, of owning the city, owning the state, owning the country owning the world, you see, that only from that base. And I think that erroneous conceptions running rapid in our community. 
is that we don't understand power because we don't understand culture. And I think that that's why we deny that we are cultural people. I mean, we'll have blood out here, um, I mean, serious and sincere about mounting a change. You see, I mean, out here on the, on the battlefront, talking about liberating the African mind and not never mention our cultural reality, never even give any legitimacy to it. And so what happens then is that we're talking about liberating ourselves as black-skinned white people, yes. not as African people. And so we don't develop an African objective, you see, an African purpose, and therefore extract an African outcome for that. So I think that, that's, that it's very important that we, this construct of cultural misorientation uh, become an understandable one for us. Because I think if it doesn't, we are going to continue to be walking around here like we have our heads cut off, trying to solve problems where the answers are right under our nose. And we are hiring somebody with a PhD or somebody else to go find it for us, and it's right there. And they going way out of town looking, you see, kind of thing. And charging you a lot of money to do it, you see, in that regard. So I think that, you know, that, that this construct is, is very critical, I think, to, to getting us in a sense of that. Let me just say one more thing about it before I go on. That, you see, I think that one thing we have to recognize about our condition as African people is to be African under white supremacy domination is an unnatural situation. See, there's nothing natural about that. Absolutely. And African people must recognize that. But white domination, miseducation of African people, right. have us accepting that as possibly normal, a normal way of life or a natural way of life, that that's okay. All we want to do is own a house, yep. uh, you know, be able to have somebody on the city council, yep. uh, to, you know, to, to have, these, have something, something that ultimately is strengthening white supremacy domination system. See, because if we're not out to destroy it, everything that we do is doing nothing more than reinforcing it. No matter how much we participate in it and how much we think we can strain out of that participation, so long as we try to participate in it, we are giving legitimacy to it, and therefore we are, in fact, reinforcing its existence. So I think that, that, that we have to be very careful about this cultural misorientation. Because in the, in the ranks of leadership among our people, that's where you find it most, most forcefully manifested. In the ranks of leadership among our people. Now, it's everywhere, don't get me wrong. But it is very severely manifested in the ranks of leadership of African people. Because they think they understand power. And even more absurdly, they think they understand white supremacy domination and they are the biggest casualties of it because they actually believe that they can achieve African liberation by working through a structure that white supremacy domination created. And will not only will they try to convince us of the legitimacy of that, they will try to bring punishing consequences to bear upon us if we don't comply, whether it's through name calling or withdrawing social status and social recognition from us, you know, and that can go in all kinds of ways, you know, in concrete ways like fire you, lose your job, you know, all kinds of other things, you see, so that we will get our African selves in line with white supremacy domination. So I think that, that uh, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, I call, I, call this, I call this book a wake-up call for the African world because I think that we, we're just like drug addicts, you know. I think we are addicted to the European worldview. And, and withdrawal is a very, a very challenging process. It is a very challenging process. If you know anything about addiction, that's, it takes all the energy you got, <laughs> you see, to try to and get out of that, to get out from under the weight, you see, of that addiction. And you will come up with every justification and rationalization you can, you see, to in fact reinforce it. I often use this analogy, uh, I've been in this, this 
uh, been fortunate enough, I guess, to be involved in the more progressive wings of this liberation movement for the last 20 years. And I've tried to be a keen observer because when I entered it, I was rather young. And to watch and see what was going on, you know, and see what we doing, seem to be doing right and what seemed to be working and what we seem to be doing wrong. And one observation I've come out of that experience with is that we have as many contradictions in the most progressive movement of African liberation as we have anywhere else in the African community. As any place else. Notice everybody got a little quiet on that one. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the point I'm making is that, you see, I, we got so much baggage that we have collected in our sojourn on the white supremacy domination that I use this analogy about, say, if the African liberation train has been announced, you know, it's going to leave the station <laughs> next week at 8 a.m. and all serious-minded Africans should be at the station to get on so we can liberate ourselves from white supremacy domination. Now, we're not talking about Africans who are confused about the Africans and all of We're talking about the ones who say they're ready. <laughs> That's the group we're talking about now. I would submit to you that when the fog lifts that morning, you know, on Liberation Day, the train is leaving the station, and all the brothers and sisters gather, everybody's going to have these duffel bags, you know. And just imagine the wisdom of the ancestors designed the entryway, you know, onto the train. Very now, it's such that just you can get through it. Okay? <laughs> what you think's going to happen? Blood's going to be trying to get through that door with them duffel bags, get stuck in the door. <laughs> and here come a wise elder, you know, one of the conductors on the train, one of our wise elders, come along and give some, you know, well, maybe if you try to leave that duffel bag, you can get home. So no, 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 I can't leave this, brother. I got, it's too important. I got some important things in here. And can you imagine? If we had something like customs, you know, when you come through, so they say, okay, this is this is chaotic now. Hey, wait a minute, we didn't plan for this. Let's dump these bags out here. Let's see what's in here. You justify, you know, this stuff you're trying to get through here, so we can get the train moving. And blood start dumping out those bags. I would suggest to you that we would try to justify every last thing in the bag. Whether well, it's some alien religion. No, 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 man, I need this. I'm committed to it. I got to keep it. This is, my, this is me, you know. Whether well, it's all these Eurocentric-like cosmetics. No, 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 I can't live without this stuff. I got, you know, it's got, that's me. I can't, I can't leave that. Hey, listen to this one. These Eurocentric names. It's a, no, 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 no. I can't leave this stuff behind. I wouldn't know myself by any other name. How can I leave that? You see? I'm talking about in the progressive circles of African life. I have witnessed this. You see? I mean, I've been in the situation where we've been harmony getting ready to lay out the plan and getting ready to action plan. And all of a sudden, we stepped on somebody's toe, something in their bag. We stepped on them. They said, wait a minute. The whole meeting broke up into disintegration and started talking about what's in the bag. And here we talking about we getting ready to mount an offensive against white supremacy domination. And all of a sudden, I mean, we were moving in harmony, everybody's rolling the rhythm, until we infringe upon somebody's duffel bag. And all of a sudden, everybody goes back and draws out their duffel bag. <laughs> and now we got the duffel bags are between them. You see? They are between African people. All this junk that we have collected from white supremacy domination is in the way. And I contend that we've got to have specific rituals that allow us to resolve that problem before it continues to occur. It seems to me that our scholars should recognize that we have been studying this problem long enough to be able to recognize what some of our fundamental deficits are and build in correctives of those deficits before they destroy our thrust toward victory. And, we, and therefore, we need ritual. As the sister was saying, we need 
See, there are, there are rituals that we should go back into our African tradition and bring some rituals forward just as they are intact. Because they mean something, you see, intact. You can't, you can't separate them outside, you see, and put in and fragment them. You must bring them full fledged for the spiritual integrity of them, you see, to achieve its vitality and expression. But the African, you see, experience is transformative. It didn't stop with Kemet. It didn't stop with traditional West African civilization. This is a part of it too. Just happened to be a highly distorted and confused and disordered part of it. But it's still a part of the legitimate African experience. Once we, once we come through the transformation of African consciousness, we'll understand that. We'll understand that it's not just that you were born in, you were born in continental Africa, so we say those are the Africans, we the blacks. Yeah. Or we the Afro-Americans. Or we the, we prefix, you see. We're not just Africans yeah. like them. Or as a brother, I don't mean to offend anybody, but a brother called on the phone the other day, said we 50-50. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, so we're not African, you know, we 50-50. 50 50-something 50 else and 50 Africans. <laughs> so we gotta give equal weight, equal time to the something else. We won't even deal with what that one is until a little later. But it's talking about the something else again. And that's defined, the something else is defining who we are and reducing, you see, the substance of the Africanity. And so what happened, that's baggage, you see, that's all it is, that's double bag. That's a double bag coming up again. And you know, we all got them. We all got them. And if we don't go through this self-searching process that Sister Marimba talked about, those duffel bags that's gonna always be, we just hide, we'll live in the corner until we need them, that's all. <laughs> until somebody offends us, and then we, hey, <laughs> open it out, <laughs> lay it on the table, and everybody else say, hey, I got mine too then. <laughs> there goes the plan. There goes the plan. Now I know, there, I know, I know some of us in this room, but I know we've been in this movement for a long time and we have seen this happen. We have seen it happen. Get to the point of getting ready to get into some substantive action. And all of a sudden, all this disharmony, yes. all these other agendas uh -huh. start hitting the table. Yes. And we leave the room <laughs> mad at each other. <laughs> and we didn't get, go get physical, you know, feeling like we should have. We didn't get the satisfaction and so on and so forth. That's dangerous, brothers and sisters. We got to come into a sense of this reality. Uh, we, are, uh, we will never be able to even think victoriously, and let alone be able to then envision actual victory. And so I believe that the way we begin to correct ourselves from this cultural misorientation or engage in the African healing process is that we can't continue to make this error that we always make of trying to start at step 10, uh -huh. assuming or presuming that somebody I guess that means white supremacy or somebody has taken care of steps one through nine. Because we want to act, again, we get caught up in this equivalence with European. And so therefore, we want to say, well, we, we, we straight. I mean, we know we, we done purged out all of this, this baggage. We ready to go. So we're going to go on and start with point 10. You know, let's go get us a store. Let's go, you know, start us a school or so on and so forth or what have you. When we haven't done the groundwork, you see, that lays the foundation for that to come into being. And so I think that that's what we have to do. If we're going to really develop a victorious plan, and I consistently challenge us throughout that manuscript about that, then first of all, we have to, somebody has to have the vision, the audacity, the courage, the African-centered courage or audacity to envision a master plan and articulate that plan to the best of their ability, drawing upon the collective wisdom of African people to our people. We must have a purpose for what we're doing. You can't go out and tell African people, well, you gotta stop raising your children that way so they'll stop fighting. Come on now, that's not gonna work. We gotta have a plan that we can give to all African people, because those over here say, well, mine not fighting. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What about mine? I'm still having problems. They're not fighting, but they don't want to do the school work or they don't want to, whatever, we're having some problems with them. I think we have to envision what is it that we need 
And I contend that we go back and study our history yeah. and study this encroachment of the Europeans, yeah. we will find that what they have destroyed about African people is our cultural infrastructure. Yeah. Right. And so that's what we must rebuild if we are going to mount a victorious struggle against white supremacy domination. We can't do that as individual Africans. We can't do that as a couple of us who are mad and we, you know, got our energy, we're going to go, you know, kick some white supremacy behind, you see. We have to develop a systematic, you know, if you will, for lack of a better term, scientific methodology for liberating ourselves. See, if you're serious, that's one thing I'll always say about Brother Bobby. He was always true to the fact that Brother Bobby believed in victory. He wasn't just out there struggling to be struggling. He said, if we're going to struggle, we're struggling to win. Not to win some skirmishes against white supremacy domination, but to literally defeat it. And the only way he saw us defeating it is that we must reclaim control of the world. Now, you can say, well, that's a tall order. You know, that's abstract, ball, and that's kind of out there, you know, <laughs> given the fact that we sitting back here can't even control our block. <laughs> you know, <laughs> many of us can't control our houses, you know, our homes, you know, in that regard. So it becomes a tall order to say we got to control the world. But again, I can, and I contend that's the fault of our scholarship. You see, our scholarship is supposed to be laying out the paradigm for this liberation movement. And I think that if we don't somehow lay out the master plan, we have no way of, inter of connecting the various isolated project, liberation projects that are going on all over the African community. They are independent projects, you yeah, see. They are. Meaningful but not nearly as meaningful as if they were brought under the umbrella of a mega objective of African world order, of what I call a pan-African world nation building. Mm -hmm. That we have to develop an objective that say, we want to reclaim the world. We can't be talking about reclaiming Washington, D.C. Right. <laughs> oh, we got to talk about the world, and then, Reclaiming the turf of Washington, D.C. makes sense because it's a part of our long-term developmental plan of retaking the world. Retaking our homes, then retaking our neighborhoods, then retaking our blocks, then retaking our cities, then makes sense. You see, otherwise, we're just retaking them to work them through for white supremacy domination all the time. And we have no other agenda then that's, we can't claim anything. We can't claim this plan is about anything. Because if they run in the world, and we run our neighborhoods, and they're going to they construct a policy that say neighborhoods got to run like such and such, and we will enforce that policy. You see? So the neighborhood control plan has to be linked to the world control plan. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. We are in a fantasy. We are playing with this struggle. We are not struggling to win. You see. And so I think that if this model does anything, it tries to locus this, this African personality within the liberation movement so that it thrusts us toward the real objective of the African liberation movement. And that is for African people to run the world again, not for us to participate in a world controlled by white supremacy domination. You are not going to be able to integrate with white supremacy domination. That is mentally disordered thinking. You see? In formal circles of psychiatry and psychology, we call that fantasy thinking. You see? And when you're living in a fantasy world, something's wrong with you. You see? And we have a whole lot of fantasy defining the African condition under white supremacy domination. We have a whole lot of fantasy. A very important thing that I think we lost in this cultural infrastructure under white supremacy domination is we lost respect for and a sense of accountability to our ancestors. Yes. We don't show any respect 
for the African who made it possible for us to be here today. And you know what? Same thing occurs or characterizes these progressive centers of the African Liberation Movement. That in all of this progressiveness that we've established, why is it that nobody, no, no great insight has occurred that somebody say, well, we need a national shrine to let the world know, you see, what our ancestors went through so that we can commit ourselves to never permit it to happen again, you see. But how can we do that if we want to forget it? We want to operate in this amnesia because we've been so miseducated, so intimidated by white supremacy domination that they make us feel ashamed of our ancestors. We are ashamed. They make us feel like it's our fault. A like one of the callers made the other day said, these people have increased the quality of African life by brutalizing us, by raping us, by murdering us, by destroying us. How crazy can you get? That's insane. That is white supremacy logic for an African person to be able to make such an insane statement and no Africans are rushing to that person to get them in a straitjacket and get them some help. That person probably went down the street and got an award that night for something. You see, it is, it is a chaotic world in which the African personality, you see, is striving for legitimacy under white supremacy domination because the contradiction is there. Africans under white supremacy domination and cultural misorientation can stand up before the whole world and make the most nonsensical, illogical statement and either be applauded for it, awarded for it, or given some extra bonus for it. And nobody is the wiser. And the next one of us say, well, better do the same thing. Yeah. And surely enough, somebody is on their heels Definitely. getting ready to do, to engage in the same kind of insanity. I mean, it just makes no sense. Let me just tell you this little one little, one little uh, experience I had in California in the, in the mid-70s when Andy Young, I think, was the, uh, was he the, the yeah, uh, the, the United Nations, yes, right, that thing. And President Amin was, you know, was uh, in, in, in power in Uganda. And the European press was going crazy. I mean, they were saying, this is a wild man. I mean, he's murdering African people. He's disrespecting royalty from Europe, you know, and this, you know, these people making them carry him around, you know, like Bawana, you know, you know, like we carry them around, you know, kind of thing. But it's crazy for him to do that and so on and so forth. And Andy Young was in Los Angeles at that, that time to accept an award from a black community group in Carson City, California, which is a predominantly black area if you know anything about California. And on the front page of the, New, of the Los Angeles Times, it said, the, it, it read, Young said Amin should be killed. That's what it said. Now here it is, a brother who's a man of the cloth, you know, when all the contradictions that mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, in the led the nonviolent movement, all this kind of stuff, <laughs> never uttered a word about Voster and any of them Europeans who had been killing African people for sport, blood still dripping from their hands at the time he was speaking, and he never even uttered their name. Look all over, they never mentioned the head of the Ku Klux and Klan or uh, any other European right here under his nose. Look all the way across the Atlantic. Found this brother on the other side of Africa. I guess they say he was tall, so maybe that's why he could see him better. <laughs> found this brother, but Andy's kind of short, you know. Found this brother way over there and moved him up to the head of the line of the most evil human beings on the planet. Mental insanity. And the next day, 
the New York Times, and I'm sorry, the Los Angeles Times in the community section said, Young receives great award from the black community for so and so and so and so. Can you imagine that? Now, what can a world, a sensible white supremacy domination world, think of African people who engage in that level of insanity? They or nobody else in their right mind could take crazy African people seriously, you see. How could they take us seriously? when we engage in the craziest behavior that you can imagine. Even when we say we challenging them, we cutting them down, and so on and so on. I could give you some other examples that make you run me out of here, so I'll let you read the book. They in the book. <laughs> you know, because uh, I'm telling you, we can, we can amount an offensive against these Europeans and be a living contradiction as we stand there challenging them, you see. As we stand there challenging them, in a most contradictory mode, a most gross contradictory mode that we can imagine. Thinking that somebody's gonna take us seriously, you see. Europeans know when you're mounting an African charge or when you're mounting a Negro charge, you okay. see. They know the difference. Cause they define the Negro charge. See, they define the parameters of that one. So they can predict it. They know what it's gonna provide. And so they know when there's a real threat to their power base in the world, or uh, whether it's, you know, them Negroes playing games again, you know, <laughs> playing games like they hold, you, hold people again, you know, what have you. So I think that if we don't, if we don't, if we don't reconnect with the Ma'afa or the African Holocaust, uh, we're going to be in trouble. Because I think it leaves a spiritual void in African people. Yes. That we're walking around here under this self-imposed amnesia, pretending that we are whole human beings. And here we are, don't want to remember the most recent part of our history. And yet we expect people in the world to take us seriously and we to have negotiation rights with people in the world. I mean, the fact that we don't show respect for our ancestors by commemorating their presence, you see, in the world. Just the fact of recognizing they were here. And they suffered. They ate slop with the animals so that they could see another day, so that their future generation could hopefully see a better day. Or uh, went to those slave quarters at night, so in the back and, you know, tired, beyond tired, you see, and tried to heal each other and then crawl out, didn't even sleep in a bed like we do, you know, slept in something that makes you kind of thing and then crawl out that next morning before the sun went up and did it again. Yes. And again, and again. We can't even imagine that. And that's the appreciation we show them. Yeah. Forget them, yeah. you see. Don't, don't remember that they were even here. Don't hold anybody accountable, first of all, ourselves, you see, for their being here. And if we don't hold ourselves accountable, we won't hold anybody else accountable, you see. And I submit to you, that's why we don't hold anybody accountable for the desecration of African life. They do it, we do it, everybody does it, you see. Destroy African life without consequence, without consequence. Our spiritually hold people would automatically have a structure of accountability. There is no way that we can claim spiritual holiness and walk around here in a condition of psychological denial, you see, shameful of our ancestors who suffered, struggled, and died so that we could be here to see this possibility of liberation. It is a shame, brothers and sisters, it is worse than a shame that we continue to sit here in this contradiction, this cesspool of white disrespect for African life and try to act like everything is normal and honky-dory. That makes no sense. Or to sit here and act like we care about African people and we care about our children and care about our community and we don't care about those who made it possible. That's a joke. That's an illness. 
That's serious. And see, that knows no, no, no boundaries in terms of the segmentation of our community. We all practice that amnesia. You see, we all practice that forgetfulness. You see. And go out and imitate European people in balls and all these other things that they do. Create their Greek social order, imitating them. Have church, wedding, everything else like them. Dress like them. Present ourselves physically like them. Can you imagine what our ancestors must think of us? They wonder what in the hell did they do all that suffering for? If their offspring are going to sit up here and disrespect them by dancing and romancing with their enemy. I mean, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. We got to have rituals in the book. I call for a, one ritual that I say, we have to have a ritual, that, a specific ritual that I call African Identity Reclamation Ritual. All right. And I think every African who lives under white supremacy domination must go through this right. We must go through it, no exceptions. We have to, if we're going to talk about re African renewal, African reclamation, the first step must be the renouncing of our affiliation, complicitness, overt, covert, conscious, unconscious, with white supremacy domination, the European worldview. We must renounce it. That must be the first phase of reclaiming, reclaiming the approval of our ancestors. Because we have disrespected them. And we have to go back and fetch it. We got to go back and reclaim them because we will never be whole so long as they haven't resumed their spiritual place in us. That's why we keep romancing their enemies because we don't understand that their enemies are our enemies because we are them. And through ritual, you see, as Sister Marimba said, that's when we reclaim our rightful place as the ancestors. You see? So therefore, their rapist is our rapist. Their brutalizer is our brutalizer. You see? Their enemy is our enemy. And we understand that when they threw those Africans down on the shores of the Atlantic, they threw Africans down, not Negroes, not colored people, Africans. And then they brought out the guns, the whips, and all the other instruments of brutality and began to try to purge that Africanity out of these poor, wretched souls. And through the three or four hundred years of purging, they led us to believe through miseducation that they extracted from us our basic African nature, when all they did was change our minds about that African nature. They made us want to deny it, disclaim it, and in doing so, we disclaim those ancestral spirits laying along the shores of the Atlantic. And I contend that's where they still are right now. That's a heavy spiritual zone. And we don't even go near it, you see. Because the only way we can go near it is through ritual. And we must do that if we are going to wage victorious war against white supremacy domination. We got to go back and get all of our armament. And we can't do it as hollow people, you see. We got to go back and fill up. So we got to spiritually go back to the banks of the Atlantic, reclaim our African selves, become whole again, you see. And then we're ready to rage victorious war against the enemies, the enemies of African people. Because we know we're African. And we know that who Africa's enemies are. And then we don't have to debate this stuff about am I a Negro color, this, that, or whatever. You were a, your great, 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 great grandmama was an African when they threw her down out of them slave ships on the shores of the Atlantic. And that's what you are. And no amount of brutality can change your basic nature. No amount of this miseducation with this inferior genetic strand can change the substantive nature of who you are. I can't help but don't do that. 
you know, it's like the issue of, you know, you've got to, you know, it's like substance versus, you know, I mean, nothing. <laughs> you know, and you're going to say that, well, I got 50% of nothing in me and 50% of substance. I'm going to define myself by the nothingness. Yeah. That's illogical. You see, I'm, I'm going to find myself by the lack of substance rather than substance. That's illogical. That's illogical. So we get, we here look like Africans. And be sitting up here and say, I wonder if I'm 50% European, wonder if I'm 25% European, and so on and so forth. You see? Because this genetic mutant has control, you see, military control. So they can expect consequences, you see, to enforce and reinforce their reality. And so they have you, in fact, what? Reversing reality and saying, well, this, 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 this mutant strand defines who I am. So if I got 25% of them, I'm not a real African. I'm a pseudo African. I'm a part African. I'm a baby African. You know, I'm a little bit African. I'm a qualified African, you see. And what have you, you see. That's dangerous logic. That's white supremacy logic. So we, we must have rituals. And, and just let me say a couple of things and I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. Uh, in terms of this whole plan of developing the cultural infrastructure, for African people. We have to, the, the, again, the, the, the progressive movement, we got to have African-centered calendars that, you see, define the practice of African character development for African people, African transformation. I mean, we got to have calendars that celebrate Nat Turner, Harriet Tubman. I'm talking about Africans who were fighting, waging a war against white supremacy domination. And stop letting white supremacy give you these impotent heroes and heroines, these Negro heroes and heroines, and leave the brothers and sisters who wage the courageous battle, you see, the correct battle, leave them in the background. Don't even put them in the book, because they make white supremacy uncomfortable. That's the only reason they leave them out. That's the only reason they don't be moved to the forefront of our celebration and our commemoration, is because White supremacy, you see, rejects them. Because it's going to reject any African, you see, that stands committed uncompromisingly against white supremacy. And so the very heroes that will give us strength and give us regenerative power, those are the ones we just say, you know, uh, I'll try to redefine them. You know, Nat Turner, he was a preacher. No, he killed Europeans. <laughs> that was the significant about it, to save African people. You see, or Harriet Tubman, she was a religious woman, but she carried that gun to kill Europeans who were trying to stop African people from trying to be free. You see, that's what our children need to understand. That's a proper role model for an African child is to learn about African people who stand against white supremacy domination. Then you're going to have a healthy child. When I was growing up, that this, 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 I believe this total misnomer we used, to, we used to argue that you, we can't teach black children the truth because they'll get them killed. And hell, they're getting blown away every day in ignorance. You see? And here we are participating in keeping them ignorant. We don't know what the outcome would be giving them some sense. Logic says it would save them and save us too. Can you imagine white supremacy got us afraid to arm our children, you see, so that they can survive white supremacy? So we keep them ignorant, naive and let them go out there like lambs being led to the slaughter. And we, the lamb leaders, leading our own children out there to be slaughtered by white supremacy. And then we wonder what's wrong when they could send, them, send us back this torn and tattered human being that we sent out with these bright eyes and all this African affirmation. And they sent us back a hump of human carnage. And we shocked and trying to wonder what's going on. Like we got all this love and trust and blind faith and white supremacy to save African people. It's a logical contradiction. So we need a calendar. We need, we need as I said, this African identity reclamation. We got to renounce these names one time, sooner or later. We got to put them down and we're going to become whole African. You see, we all ought to have at least two. One for the plantation until we can get our own control of the world and one for the community, one for the family, you see. Because that, that, that shows a recognition of the contradictory condition under which we live. Anything else is a fallacy. It's a fantasy, you see? So we ought to have it. 
we got to have life cycle rituals just like we had in traditional African society. We can't, you know, it's fine us to get caught up in, let's have a rite of passage. So we'll wait till they get 14 years old. And let's have a 14 year old rite of, well, what, what's happened to the first 14 years? They on way later. And then we get, we wonder what's going on because that six months or that one year of rite of passage didn't change it. I mean, what, we, what do we think we're trying to do? We got to create a life experience that's developmental, you see, around changing uh, our, our, our young people and developing that. We got to have not only life cycle rituals that go from recognition of conception to ancestral hood and all in between. So we in fact create an environment where our children are constantly experiencing African affirmation and rededication and recommitment to African nation building, to an Africa, the creation of an African world order and their place in it at the various levels of their development. We got to have that. So that when they get to be adults, they already know they charge, they already been participating in it. You see? And they're ready to thrust our community on toward a, a victorious charge toward this goal. We need daily rituals, as Sister Marimba said. We got to have rituals that guide us through the day, that regenerate us. White supremacy is rough. You see? And we got to have an ongoing regenerating charge to enable us to do African centered battle with white supremacy. And of course, we need resolution rituals, as, as Sister Marimba said. We need sacred rituals. You see, we, we need to, we got to bring spirituality back. We got to reject these alien religions. We got to give them all up and reclaim our African spiritual system. That's going to hurt us. That's going to make us mad. You're probably getting mad at me. <laughs> but they're not African systems. We can debate all night, and we probably will attempt to. But they're not African systems. An African system is created out of the collective reality of African people not by some individual Africans or some isolated Africans. It's by the collective part. And if we don't see it growing out of the collective, you see, center of African life, then it's not African. It's something else. It's alien. And so we must have that. I hope that uh, this manuscript, I hope all of you get a copy of it. I believe every serious-minded African ought to have a copy of it, whether you agree with it or not. I think it places on the table, the discussion table, a different kind of dialogue about our condition. And I think that if we permit ourselves to engage in this line of dialogue, I think that good things, affirmative things, are going to happen for our people. So it's not about, it's not about Kobe Combone. You don't have to agree with me. I could be wrong. But I think we got to have some other issues on the table to dialogue about. So when African people have a radio show or a talk show or a conversation on the street corner, we talking about African nation building. We ain't talking about some old nonsense of who's going to win a football game or something else. We're talking about African nation building. We got life in perspective. And I, and I certainly hope that that would be the case. Uh, certainly we want to know what you think about it, you know, so let us know what you think about it. We, we're always open to, to very genuine critique from our community because we, we are striving for African excellence. We don't want anything less in our liberation struggle. Our people don't deserve anything less. So if it can do anything more than just stir us to engage, to bring our collective genius to bear up on this issue, and let's move it forward, then so be it. That's what the ancestors would have wanted to happen, Asante Sama.